This is Keith Chandler, and you're rocking with Young Atlas. This shit is so easy, call it a layup. Sky walking on the beat like the son of a Darth Vader. I can spar melodic rappers and talk about getting paper, but the money only matters to international bankers who they create the money. We just go and spend it, giving back, drinking Hennessy and jewelry for the bitches. See, the doctor rapper been fed up for a minute. Fake execs and the scammers been fouling me all scrimmage. The game need a referee. Keith, thank you for sitting down with us today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. We're gonna get into a lot of interesting topics. Um, First off, tell me where you're from. I'm from Jersey City, New Jersey. Okay. Born and raised? Born and raised. Gotcha. So you like the urban environment we were talking about off camera a little bit. Yeah, I got to be able to, you know, pick things up here and there. I can't really... If I got to drive more than 30 minutes to get there, it's a problem for me. So I got to be in the city. Gotcha. So you like being in this Harlem atmosphere we're at <laughs> right now? You I know? love Harlem. Yeah, that's what's up. Red Rooster, I've been there like twice. I was like, I'm going to come here every weekend. but Yeah, yeah, that's a good experience. It's nice and elegant over there. Exactly. Yeah. Not nah, for sure. So let's get right into it. I want to talk about, you know, the different facets of your life and then kind of bring it back to rapping. So, okay. and your music creative journey. Let's first talk about what you do now. I know you're a PhD. Tell me a little bit about that journey, how you got into um, that field. So what I do now, um, I'm a full-time professor, uh, college professor. Um, going to college for the first time was just, you know, a different experience for me coming from, you know, the urban environment. And, you know, I appreciated just the load of experiences and, you know, networks that I made throughout the process. And trying to find out what I was going to do in terms of my profession, I found that, you know, much like making music and performing, teaching was something that is, you know, a performance as well. And one of the ways to do that and to have some type of security behind it is to learn how to teach, you know, professionally. You get that by going to get a doctoral degree. So I have a, um, a master's in social work as well as a doctoral, doctoral degree in social work. And it kind of just taught me just, you know, kind of break down the profession and the science of, you know, what social work is to my students. So much like being on stage, when I'm in a classroom, I'm teaching my, stu I'm teaching my students, it's kind of like I'm performing in that aspect as well. So I finished with my degree, my doctoral degree in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, I found a job, luckily, um, at the University of New Jersey. So I'm blessed, I guess you could say. For sure. And... We were talking a little bit off camera about some of the integrating back into society mm -hmm. with, can you tell me a little bit about that? Were you working with some, some prisons? Mm -hmm. How, how was that working out? Yeah. So, you know, basically with social work, a lot of people believe that, or, you know, the stigma is that social workers only work with like children and, you know, you work with food stamps, you're taking kids out the home and stuff like that. But there's so many different things you can do with a social work degree. So. Um, just from my experiences growing up, I mean, I got seven uncles, they all been in and out of prison and, you know, in my neighborhood, it's like, I've always seen people leave and come back and they've been struggling with just, you know, being successful in the community. Um, so what I wanted to do is really focus on, you know, helping those that don't understand what a healthy, you know, reintegration process looks like, right? So you have people who have been in and out of jail throughout their whole lives. So sometimes they want, or it's uncomfortable for them to do things on their own. You know, I've had somebody to tell me when to wake up, when to go to sleep, when to eat for all these months, in some cases, years, right? And when you come out, you don't really have too much support. Like you leave and you're gone for a minute and everybody else's life continue. And when you come back, they got to make time for you, you know, to kind of bring you up to date to, to, to what happened. So being in Baltimore, I started working with um, the Office of the Public Defender in uh, the social work department. And what we did were we were responsible for creating release plans for older African, well not older African American, older men who were coming back from prison to make sure that once they landed back in the community that they were gonna be successful. They were gonna be able to get a job, you know, see their family, take care of themselves. And we started to see so many different um, challenges that they were faced with that most people weren't really talking about. And that was just like health, having support. Um, and then, you know, that could be very frustrating. We see people go in and out of prison all the time. You know, usually they come home and want to do the right thing and say, you know, I want to find a way to be able to apply for a job or, you know, build a resume. Or, But when they come out, you know, bills got to be paid. They got to eat. They got to, you know, find a way to get a roof over their head. And all of that pressure sometimes, you know, pushes them back into what they know how to do. 
right? right? Which might be, you know, selling drugs, doing this, doing that, whatever it may be. But all you need is like somebody to really take the time out to say, you know what, I'm gonna help you through this process to get back on your feet. So we were able to do that with some of the work that I was doing out in Baltimore and I'm trying to transition um, the same thing into, you know, the, the greater New York area, Jersey area as well. Right, and you bring up an interesting point, right? Because when you first get out, it's like, you just kind of get smacked with like a truck. It's all that pressure that mm -hmm. now you have to deal with. Reality strikes mm -hmm. and you doing the right thing isn't going to pay any bills, right? Mm -hmm. So what is it like in those first, let's say, a couple of weeks to a month? Like, mm -hmm. how? What are some of the things that you would advise if you were just in their shoes coming out of institutionalism? Mm -hmm. How would you like convert what would be the first few things you would do to kind of get on the right track yeah so one thing that I started to see that kind of um, hurt individuals when they come back into the community is that they don't really have a plan for when they come out or a discharge plan working with um, some of the some of the staff within the prison okay. so um, every prison should have basically somebody that's in charge of your discharge plan mm -hmm. you know where you're gonna be living what type of services that you need and they kind of leave a lot of gaps into some of the needs and services that are open for them to utilize once they come home. Right. So there's no reason why if you know that there's a um, job training workshop or if there's a um, if there's a soup kitchen nearby, right? There's no reason why they shouldn't have a list of all of these different service programs in their area once they go home. Mm -hmm. Right. That make things a little bit easier. So that way, if something does happen, I know where to go. Right. Right. But at the same time, you know, if you are coming out, you have to be able to advocate for yourself. Sometimes, you know, especially if you've been gone for a minute, you want to get back and see your friends, see your family. You might forget about that part. Right. Or you might have people that said that they'll take care of you once you come out. All right. But how long are they going to take care of you? And it sounds good. But, you know, life happens and they might not be, be able to do what they said they were going to do. Right. All right. So when you come in, now you're starting to see that, well, this isn't what I thought it was going to be when I come home. Frustration starts to come in. But if you set up so much support around you that, you know, if this doesn't work out, I have this. And if this doesn't work out, I have that. You're fine. Right. right? right. But you got to go back and, you know, really put together a full fledged plan. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to do in the next 30 days. This one I'm going to do in the next 90 days. If I keep doing this, this is how things should look within a year. Right. No, for sure. And that organization, that structure, I mean, that that can help you with success in any field, right? Mm -hmm. If you have that, you know, a lot of people, even in the game of life, have no plan. Like, they don't know what, what all right, I want to be this big superstar, mm -hmm. but you have no goal for this week what you're going to attain to get to that level, right? Exactly. So what you're saying is really, a, you're setting them up with a game plan to win in the game of life as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Because if you go into anything with just a vague goal and no really organized blueprint, it's kind of a recipe for chaos and disaster. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a prisoner, I just got released. There's no, as you said, what really interests me was the discharge plan, right? Like, mm -hmm. so they're not telling me, hey, you should do this, this, and that when you leave. Like, mm -hmm. there's no one to check in. Mm -hmm. Or am I just out, like, mm -hmm. pretty much with my bag and mm -hmm. get out of here? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? Like, mm -hmm. the transition process. I mean, you got to think of, like, every situation is, I can say, in, individual um is a case by case basis. Okay. So, you know, it, luckily if you have a good discharge plan, they're gonna try to set you up with, you know, some support and resources. Right. Now, if you're on criminal monitoring, their priority is gonna be, all right, what you're gonna do in order to not, you know, come back behind these bars is meet with your parole officer uh, during these dates, set up these appointment times. This is when you're gonna check in, right? My yeah. cousin came home from jail um, two, almost two years ago and she was like all the way upstate. She was at, uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell you where she was at, but yeah, she yeah. was like r extremely far from, you know, where she had to be. So, you know, the first day that she came out, instead of us like going to get something to eat, you know, going to try to get us some clothes, we had to go right to parole and probation. So from coming out of prison and she's, you know, doing this long ride with me, we gotta go right here for people to tell her, this is what you gotta do. This is where you need to be. These are your scheduled appointments. We didn't even get on the E. I was starving. I'm sitting in the car just waiting for her. Right. 
Right. So I was just like, you know, they're not going to prioritize how you're going to be able to keep your mental health stable throughout this process. So what you have to do is to be able to put that plan together for yourself to make sure you, that you keep your sanity. Right. All right. Basic needs is what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Right. You're all, that's always going to supersede the things that you're looking at. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll go to jail before I miss a meal. Yeah. I can't. How am I going to think clearly without no food in my stomach? Right. Exactly. No. Okay. So it's really a, a case by case thing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you this. Do you see the level of crime going up or down? Where do you think the status is now currently in our times? The level of crime going up and down is funny because I was having a conversation with some of my students before and you know, the trend is always saying that things are worse today than they were ever, Yeah. right? And I don't know if I really agree with that because I think we just learn faster about things that are going on than you know 50 years ago when we didn't have access to like twitter and text message and you know facetime so we get the information like something tragic happens in idaho we'll learn about it in the next two minutes opposed to you know in the 1960s like right, a newspaper right. would come out and they'll probably just you know mail it out and then we'll see and then we start a conversation about it but what people don't understand is that crime only exists or what reinforces crime is poverty mm -hmm. Right, and we live in a capitalist economy, so there has to be a, a a population of poor people. Right. Whenever you have a population of poor people, they're gonna fight for the resources, and after fighting for the resources, you then inform crime. Right. Right. If I have all the money in the world, I'm not robbing nobody up the block for their watch. If I can go buy that watch, right? Why would I do that? Yeah. Especially if not if it's not gonna take any food out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. So what we have to be able to look at is just you know create better programs for some of the communities that. Um, are, un are underserved, mm -hmm. right? And then we'll start to see the crime begin to decrease. Okay. Especially if we're looking at, you know, the communities that are around us right now, right? With all the gentrification, we're seeing that the crime is gonna start to decrease, yeah. right? However, those people are gonna be displaced to a whole nother area where the crime is gonna rise. Gotcha. It's pretty much how it's gonna be. So it's kind of like um, an opportunity, an economic issue, obviously, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And then that goes back to kind of a lot of people's careers, the reason they come to this country, the American dream, right? And that American <laughs> dream is social mobility. Mm -hmm. And the more I look into it and I see different people, I talk to different families, it just seems that it's becoming more and more of a myth, right? Yeah. And it's not like you can't achieve whatever you want, but there is, and I'm sure, and I'm asking this question to you because you work in it, you must see a, a, a cycle that can be somewhat hard to even grasp that that is reality for mm -hmm. some people, you know? Mm -hmm. Can you go into that if it just may be an example of how that how that dream can somewhat be a myth? Because mm -hmm. there is like a lack of opportunity based on the system that people are put in, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, we live in like I said before, with the capitalist economy that we have, you know, you have the opportunity to make as much money as you can. Yes. But you have to have access to the resources. Right, right to, to be able to do that. You know, you can fight and say that, you know, the American dream is for me to be able to have all of these opportunities in the centers. But if you're in a community where you see that, you know, you're trying your best to be able to do things and it's just not working out for you because of so many barriers that exist that we don't talk about, you know, what are you gonna do? Right. Like if I'm if I'm sitting here and, you know, I understand and this was something that actually, you know, affected me growing up as a teenager, it's like I wanted to get a job. Mm -hmm. Right. And then with the recession, I started to realize early on and, ha and having conversations with my mom. She talked about being a teenager and, you know, we had these type of jobs. Everybody in my school, you know, had this type of work program. So we would go, you know, work at ShopRite. We would go work at, you know, um, any type of fast food restaurant, Burger King, McDonald's. When the recession hit and, you know, I was a teenager a couple years, you know, uh, about five or six years after that. There was no way for me to get a job because when I walked right. into those places to fill out an application, there were people there that were older, that right. were going back to work because they needed to, you know, uh, they needed to go back to work because the money and the resources that they had started to diminish. Gotcha. So when they go back after retirement, that's a job that I can have. Right. So if those jobs don't exist, what do you think I'm going to do to go get some money? Of course. So now I'm involved in all of these different things that I probably shouldn't be involved in, putting myself at risk, put my family at risk. And now it's like... I was told that the opportunities would be endless, but every time that I show up and try to make good of myself, 
right? I have this roadblock in front of me that nobody's going to help me move. Right. Makes a lot of sense. And so I commend you because you were able to show a lot of grit through your journey and you were able to go to college and then take it to the next level with mm -hmm. it, right? And also use a lot of your personal experiences in a way to give back and try and help those people. Mm -hmm. So I do commend you for that. Appreciate and it. I do want to ask you about the college experience. You know, what what was that like? What were the what were some pros, what were some cons? What was your general outlook on whether college was worth it or not? And I ask that to say that's just a, an ongoing debate now because it's mm -hmm. becoming so expensive. Yeah. And I think it's kind of sad that there's no vocational training in high school. You know, I can go on for days, but what was your take on that? So for me, college was just, college was an opportunity. Right. Right. That I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. Like I was focused on, you know, when I, when I started to, you know, kind of change my own morals and values, I was like, I'm going to be in the streets. Yeah. This is where I'm going to be. My mom's like, you know, one day when you're not living in Jersey City, I'm like, well, I'm leaving Jersey City. I couldn't even fathom it. Right. And, you know, I got called to go to college um, two weeks after it started. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it just was like, yo, we accepted you and, you know, we're going to get you this thing called the loan. I didn't know what a loan was. I was right. like, all right. My mom's like, a loan was great. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that. <laughs> it's not too great. <laughs> it's not too great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they call me every day. Right, right. So, you know, once I got to college, I didn't know how to navigate, you know, um, just being on a campus, like, you know, they, they pulled me up there um, 40 minutes away from my house. I don't even know how to get back home. And while I'm there, I'm just trying to figure out, like, where's the cafeteria? You know, where do I got to go for class? Like, where's the books? Where do I sleep? Is there a curfew? Like, I, it's all this autonomy now that I have, and I got to learn how to, you know, manage it. So college with the pros is definitely a good opportunity for somebody to learn how to manage responsibilities early on. Right, I went to college at 17, right? So after a while, I was like, you know, I kind of was already fully functioning because I knew how to like, you know, wash clothes and, you know, things of that nature. But having to figure out or having to instill the responsibility of, yo, you got to wake up and go to class. Yo, you got to make sure you do this. You got to make sure you do that. Nobody else is going to tell you to do it. It helps you to build that resilience and that you know, level of functioning independently. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's good. And you have a cushion under you because if, you know, you do hit some roadblocks you can go to like student services or somebody that can point you in the right direction right right so with the um with learning responsibilities and networking um that's really you know the best part of it okay when you're sitting there in an environment of people that you're not related to and you kind of live with them like you're on campus you live with them you see yeah. them in the morning you see them throughout the day and then you see them at night before you go to sleep right right so you have to learn how to balance that responsibility as well as your social life at the same time. Yeah. So what the cons is, the cons of going to college are one of one the loans. Yeah. Because I tell people all the time, like you know, if you can't find a way to pay out of pocket or you can't get some grants, you got to find another way because the loans will add up. Yeah. But um, some people aren't ready for that level of responsibility. Right. And so many people that I know came into college with me, and they dropped out or they got kicked out because they didn't know how to manage it, yeah. right? So I'm sitting on the porch of the campus in front of staff and college administrators smoking weed because I don't know no better. I don't know that this is gonna carry on me the rest of my life. I don't know that this is gonna significantly affect me and nobody's told me. They've just told me you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. And I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it anyway, right. right? I'm not going to class because I'm like, I'll be all right. You know, I don't have to go to class today because I'm tired. I was drinking last night. I got a hangover. So you got to make some changes. Like, if you know that you like to go out and party, maybe you should pick your party days. Maybe you should put together a schedule. And some people don't know that or have the support to sit them down and say, hey, try to figure out a schedule for yourself because I've never done it in my life. I went to high school and I knew I had to be up at the class by 8 o'clock and I knew that I could leave at 430. They made these rules. Mm -hmm. well, now I get to make the rules. Right. I don't know how to manage that. Yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure. And like you say, you got to rise to the occasion. You got to create that structure mm -hmm. within. So that, that is a very important skill. And I feel like it's also important to use college as a vehicle mm -hmm. to really know, like, I'd say in today's day and age, it might be better after you leave high school, take a year off, mm -hmm. maybe figure out what you want to do with your life mm -hmm. and then use college as a stepping stone to get you there. Yeah. Not like 
because it's so expensive, right? It's like a luxury. Yeah. If you don't really know what you want to do, you're just going to college to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Might be an expensive choice, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of used it then as a vehicle to push what you wanted to do in terms of getting your PhD mm -hmm. and working in social work. Mm -hmm. So in terms of another lane to switch a little bit with your artistry, how did that come into the picture with you trying to make music? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you pivot? Um, well, first of all, you know, I, I was always very interested in, you know, some type of avenue with regards to music because my mom's like a huge hip hop head. Okay. So, um, I wanted to figure out a way to express myself. I've always been, you know, an expressive person. Like if, if something's on my mind, I want to be able to share. Right. And when I was in college, I was still trying to experiment and trying to figure out what skills I wanted to, right. you know, I wanted to utilize in, in terms of my career. And I had a, I was actually, I was a double major in undergrad to where I had a communication degree as well. So it was radio television. So okay. I was thinking about like, you know, doing radio, trying to be like a radio personality. I had a, a radio show um, that I would do on Monday nights when I was at Satinary. And from that aspect, I wanted to get into like engineering. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to be able to just find a skill or a craft that, you know, I could focus on and, you know, it kind of instilled some level of confidence in me just right. to learn something and then do it and do it successfully. Yeah. Um, so in that, in that journey, I attempted to try to rap over instrumentals to try to mix on my own. And some of the stuff that I would say, like I bring back to the dorm, had these like rocket six speakers and I would try to listen to them to see if the mix was good and I would let people you know, hear for feedback, and they were like, yo, but the things you're saying are like dope. Right. But it's literally everything that I say to people on a daily basis. Yeah. Like I said, I was like always expressive, um, more so like a motivational, like public speaker with my friends, things of that nature. So um, it's just doing it, rhyming it. Right, right. Right? Yeah. So I'm trying to like tell you about all these different concepts with the beat behind me and, you know, kind of like just projecting my vocals and trying to be creative and how I say certain words for sure so when I'm doing it it's like it's getting easier and easier and easier but I'm actually able to talk about many different things that I would always want to talk about throughout the course of conversation right so instead of just having a face-to-face -face conversation with one person or having a you know be in front of like this huge audience doing some you know type of speaking engagement I'm able to put it on a track and just share it with you and then you got the message for sure for sure and it's also through your various experiences, you have a lot of relatable topics that a lot of people can, oh, okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. I see what he's saying there. So yeah. it builds a whole story, mm -hmm. you know? And that and that's kind of why I was taking the interview in this path, just to mm -hmm. show the different areas of your life that, yeah. so then people could say, wow, I see his story. I gotta listen to his music because there's so many things that touch me just by listening, mm -hmm. you know, to it mm -hmm. and understanding him. And I feel like, that's important for artists today to understand. 100%. You gotta really be telling a story, you yep. know, and that's how you build a fan base because people wanna not just know, all right, you sip lean and you have a Bentley, mm -hmm. but like, what's behind that? Who are you yeah. as a person, you know what I mean? And that's, I feel like that might be a problem in today's day and age. Mm -hmm. Not trying to sound like an old head, there's tons of <laughs> artists out there, yeah. but I'm saying, you know, that authenticity is important. We, mm -hmm. can't, we can't get away from that because at the end of the day, Hip hop, especially, it was made to tell stories, right? Exactly. And mm -hmm. and give a voice for people that didn't have one, right? You know, so I really commend that, and because you have your own story that you have to tell, and you're also goal oriented with it, because you understand, and you had to maybe learn the hard way or didn't. Like, yo, you gotta have your own schedule with it. You know, mm -hmm. you gotta be on top of your goals. What are some of your goals with the music? Where are you trying to take that? Like in the next year or so, where are you trying to go? In the next year, I want to definitely be able to increase my audience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people always say it when they hear about my, you know, my story and so many different, you know, things that I've done in my life that are so different. They're like, you need to write a book. And I'm like, well, I make music. So, right. you know, this is, That's you know, book. yeah, this is a book. Yeah, it's yeah, just not on, sure. you know, it's you not on paper then. Yeah, yeah. So within the next year, I want to just be able to, you know, get my voice and get my story in the ears and eyes of as, as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm able to do that by you know, number one, making more music and being more consistent 
you, you know, I tend to make music and then disappear for a little bit, create and then come back. Yeah. So I'm looking to be more consistent with just dropping more projects. And right. I want to be able to tour a lot more. Um, I want to get to cities that I've never been to perform. What I've started to understand and see is that, you know, once you get in front of more people, right, you can touch certain people that can become, you know, um, avid fans. And they'll start to, you know, promote music for you. They're they like ambassadors, yeah. Yep. No, so, for sure. So if I can get to, like, different regions and, you know, um, get over back over to L.A., that, back down to Atlanta, and even the small markets, like, you know, hit, like Baltimore, Buffalo, you know, some places like that. Right. That's something that I have, you know, for the next year I want to focus on. Right. So, so kind of spreading your message and your brand to mm -hmm. different places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you also understand the business side of music, which mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. like you put on your own events yep. and you work with a company, True and Living. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that brand, how that came about. So True and Living started because when I was in Baltimore making music, I had some of my friends that were still here in Jersey. Um, helping me put things together, like helping me produce shows. Um, we were doing events down in Baltimore that were really well, and they would yeah. drive all the way down, and we just, you know, um, produced the event. And when I moved back, I was like, we need to kind of make this a brand. Like these different things that we're doing, a lot of people aren't doing, and I want to continue to, you know, increase the productivity of what we do, as well as open an avenue to be able to help artists. Yeah. So with the company, um, co-founded with uh, three of my other uh, co my, my partners, Carolyn Maul and Andy, we wanted to create this brand and this company that was going to be able to assist artists in trying to figure out exactly how to navigate the music business. Yeah. Right. So throughout all the money that we were like wasting and putting money here and putting money there and seeing that all right, well this didn't work out or you know that that room right there is you know a room that you don't want to be in because once you get in you're going to burn up. Yeah. Right. We wanted to be able to educate. So now I'm going back to like my profession. I always like to educate people. Right. If I have all of these experiences, I can tell you that, you know, if you are looking to do this, how about you try it this way? Because it'll work. Right. Don't put a thousand dollars in this. Put two hundred dollars into this and see what you get out of it. OK. If you get a lot of stuff out of it next time, put five hundred into it. Right. What do you get out of it? So with the company, we want to be able to manage, help artists, help create, you know, uh, events and produce events do consultation, all of that stuff, um, just to continue to push the brand and push the level of artistry for, you know, those who want to create. Yeah, for sure. No, I love that. And let's educate the viewers a little bit um, real quick and mm -hmm. just go through a hypothetical question. Let's say, let's say we have a um, thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. An artist does to invest. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the, and they're just starting out and they're trying to grow their brand, what would you say is some smart things they should invest in as an artist? Number one, in-home studio. Okay. Right? So a lot of artists want to just hurry up and take their money and go find an a engineer and then go, you know, lay down a freestyle. Yeah. Right? But you got to learn how to record in the studio. Because if not, you're going to go in there and waste your time. For sure. I book, you know, I book a three-hour studio session. The first hour I'm in there trying to find a beat, the second hour I'm in there trying to write to the song, the third hour I'm working on my cadence, you didn't even record anything, but you spent three hours in the studio. Right. So being able to buy, and you can get a setup for like $200, mm -hmm. put that into your, your crib and just practice on recording and how you want your voice to sound, right? Then after you do that, you definitely need to work on um, finding people who, who can help you produce consistent content, mm -hmm. right? So investing in a camera, investing in you know somebody to be able to travel with you to take photos um and then you also got to make sure that you find a producer okay right you got to find somebody that's going to you know give you beats if you got somebody that you know wants to collaborate with you he'll make beats for you for free because you're part of a team great sure. if you don't you got to outsource so you got to be able to buy beats whether you license them or whether you're trying to get them exclusively um and then figure out your brand you know use some of that money for some type of consultation with um, some executive or somebody that who's like a publicist or um, somebody who understands what it takes, right, to get your to get the message in front of an audience that people will like. Right. Schedule yourself a photo shoot. Get yourself a website. Once you're able to do all of those things, if your music is good enough, you know you have a lot that you can push out to the audience that you know, in all essence, should come back into your pockets. Right. Right. No, totally. Yeah, so that makes sense. Really build that 
infrastructure mm -hmm. that you can build upon. Love that. I just wanted you to educate the audience a little bit more. Let's say someone's coming back home, getting reintegrated into society. What is some advice you would give them based on your career so far? So basically, you know, you got to make sure that your mental health is great. Okay. Like you have to make sure because that journey is going to be tough. Right. Right. So I subscribe to therapy. You know, I go to therapy if I need to. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot. Like I have this, you know, song that I got on my, my debut album, The Nice Take, called My Teacher Was My CO. Okay. Right? And it talks about how you're kind of indoctrinated um, into this society to where people are going to tell you what to do. Right. Right? And like I said before, if you don't, you know, have any rules set out for you, you're going to be stressed out. Yeah. But if you're able to understand and build, like, this level of self-determination or self-awareness, you're going to be more comfortable even if you start to hit a couple bumps in the road. So making sure that your mental health is great for, is the first thing that you should be able to do. You gotta be comfortable in your own skin, or else you're gonna sit there and like, you know, just struggle. Yeah. Right. That but if you have, sense. you take care of your mental health, you get those supports around you, like I talked about before. You know, you'll be fine. Cause you have somebody that's gonna, you know, walk you through the process, right, and speak to you in, in times, in you speak to you in times when it gets tough, and then you're also gonna have people physically around you who are gonna be able to pick you up on days that aren't so good. Right. Okay, let's educate the artist and back to music for now. I love that answer, by the way. That's very insightful. In terms of music, what have you learned so far in your journey that if you want to take music as a career, that artists may be taken for granted or some things they might may not know? Mm -hmm. You know, some things that, wow, this, this surprised me. I didn't know it was this crazy. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of curveballs the industry yeah. will throw at you. I think that artists, some things that might surprise artists when they first get into the music industry is that it takes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you see all the money that you know people get because you see chains and you see the you know, cars yeah. and you see them in the strip club doing all this, you know, all this money, and they see what you get. You know, they they see the reward, but they don't see the investment. You know, you don't you rappers aren't going out there and saying, "Yo, I had to invest all this money into this tour." Mm -hmm. Right, you see a rapper. Like, let's say I was on tour with uh, Wale. Yeah. Right, Wale says, "Yo, I like your music. You know, I'm doing a, a ten city tour." Right, Wale might tell me, "You know, I'm gonna need ten thousand dollars for you to be on this tour. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna need ten thousand dollars because I'm gonna need for your expenses for you know your hotel, right? For your airfare, right? I'm gonna need it for whatever marketing promotion that we're gonna need to do for the show, and also I'm gonna need uh, it for the DJ for his services that he provides during your slots." Right. Yeah. So you have to be able to have that money. If I want to be on tour while late, I go gotta go five ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. So understanding that it takes a lot of money is definitely something that artists should should know. Right. If you're able to get or gain money early on from making sh from doing shows or events, put that money right back into the company, or you know, if it's just you, put that back into your music. Got right. You. Also, you have to be aware of you know the people who don't have the best interests of you, especially with social media. You have access to, you know, individuals who hit your email, hit your phone, right? And they'll text you all type of wild stuff. But yeah. you can't jump on every single opportunity without doing your research. One yeah. of my homies right now, um, two of my homies actually, Olive and K Poetic, I do some music with them. They own um, Coffee and Kim Trails on my um, Posse Cut track. They got a text from the other day from somebody from uh, supposedly Def Jam, yeah. right? And the message says, it's Def Jam. Hit me back. Yeah. A music exec went in... You know, text somebody something like that without any type of detail behind it. Yeah, Def Jam is a company. It's a company, yeah. right? <laughs> so if somebody that doesn't know or just got into the music industry sees that, and let's say they got a thousand streams on one of their songs, like, oh, guy from Def Jam must have seen me on SoundCloud. Let me hit him back. Yeah. And then you hit him, and he's like, yo, first thing you got to do is we got to get your paperwork right. Because they love saying that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that's going to be $500. You right, get a $500, right. then this phone gets turned off. Yeah, now exactly. you got $500. No, for sure. I've heard some like crazy ones. Like, um, we're going to need $700 to fly you out to uh, to California to mm -hmm. sign this record label. Mm -hmm. What? Like, I could find, buy the tickets my damn self. Exactly. I could definitely fly Spirit for one Nah, for sure. <laughs> you got to watch out for those sharks. Now. Yeah. That, that is good advice. Um. And then going on, um, let's go deeper into that question. When, when finding or looking for someone to help with your career, let's say a manager mm -hmm. or 
publicist, whatever, mm -hmm. what are some qualities, some traits you should look for, let's say, when finding a manager or someone to work with mm -hmm. to help be like someone, an advisor, let's say, you know? It got to be somebody that you trust. Mm -hmm. um, number one, music is a business. So you yeah. got to find somebody that understands business. Right. Right. If you're able to do that, you know, you'll be able to understand where to put your money. Yeah. Right. How much money you bring it back, where to invest it. So, you know, if you can find somebody that's really business savvy, that's definitely somebody that you want to keep close to you. Right. As far as a publicist, you want to find somebody that has an idea of what branding looks like and also mm -hmm. has some type of connections. Mm -hmm. Because you want to get in spaces where you're going to be able to network with people that want to continue to work with you and help you, you know, push your brand. Right. And, you know, that just comes from you doing research and doing your own networking and, you know, going to events where you can, you know, bump into somebody that's doing some good work. Right. right. Even asking people, you know, do you recommend somebody that I should work with? If you see somebody that, you know, does photography and he does dope photography and you're looking for somebody that, you know, has a, a studio. Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, can you recommend somebody that is maybe an engineer or somebody that I can work with? And, you know, if you trust this person's work, you know, they're not going to recommend you to somebody that isn't going to produce high quality work if they are. Right, right. So, you know, definitely try to make sure that you have, um, you know, your business right, your connections right, and do your research. You know, sure. don't just jump on and start working with the first person that says, you know, they want to align with your brand. I've had, you know, publicists in the past that I didn't want to work with. I had managers in the past that I eventually didn't want to work with, and I ended up losing a bunch, a bunch of money in the process. But mm -hmm. what I got back, you know, that you can't measure in money is the experience of one, knowing what not to do. Right. And who not to work with. Yeah. Like that is, that's still good knowledge, even mm -hmm. though you might not learn it in the right way. Like mm -hmm. you still, it's a mistake you know not to look for, you mm -hmm. know, not for sure. That's important. And that's also an important mindset. Like people might get turned off by certain things, but you also got to see the good in it, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's important in any business, whatever you're going to yeah. get, you got to turn a negative into a positive in some way to keep, you know, keep moving because... Well, if you're gonna get on this road in the music business, if you're a manager, publicist, or an artist, or whatever facet around it, you gotta be willing to get hit with some curveballs, you know, because mm -hmm. it's not, it's gonna be a bumpy ride, right? Yeah. It's not just a bunch of ups, you know? Yeah. Um, so going with that, let's talk about the business a little bit more. What are some goals for a true and living in the next, like, you know, let's say 2020? What do you guys got lined up? Because I know you got a lot of events going on, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things happening. We still want to continue with our monthly event where Beast Me Bars, our open cipher event. Nice. Um, we want to continue to push to build the audience as much as we can. You know, the more audience we get in, the more money we can keep giving out to artists to whenever, whenever they win in right. um, our prizes. And we want to start to actually take the event, you know, on the road more. Okay. Like we did um, South by Southwest last year. We did Brooklyn. Um, we wanted, we did uh, like South Jersey, Central Jersey. But we definitely want to make sure that we get into places where we can um, target a market from different coasts and different regions. So right. bring it down south, bring it over to the West Coast, bring it to the Midwest. That'll all be great. So if we can try our best to, you know, try to find collaborators in those areas that will be interested in working with us, you know, definitely be dope. Continue that. This will be our 27th one coming up. Nice. Um, so if we can just continue to, 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 to make the event bigger, um, definitely looking forward to doing that. Definitely looking forward to working with more artists and collaborators. We want to definitely, you know, um, find people who are right-minded and like-minded like we are yeah. that understand the benefit of, you know, creatives and um, getting the most out of individuals who put work in. Like, if you like this business and you love this business and you want to put a bunch of work into it, well, let's all come together so we can get something out of it as well to make sure everybody benefits across the board. For sure. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great motto because there needs to be a lot more collaboration with other, um, you know, business people. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, a lot of these companies think they're Hot 97 versus Power 105 mm -hmm. and those are, you know, huge billion dollar companies mm -hmm. behind them. You know, there's a lot of power in collaborating, mm -hmm. and um, and they did it to they did it with other people. Yeah, like, everybody exactly. think it's just them. Like right. I tell people all the time, is like DIY. The DIY model is like it's cool to learn things, but the DIT to do it together. Yeah, like that model goes. That that model is one that lasts and, and definitely expands across all broads. No, for sure, for sure. Um, and I wanted to lastly just talk to you about the project um, Coffee Chemtrails. 
Can you tell me a little bit about that project? I know you recently mm-hmm. released it. What was the story behind that? Mm-hmm. So, uh, with Coffee and Chemtrails and you know the story behind it, before I dropped this album, I had dropped the, my debut, which was the Knots tape. Okay. And that was actually the story of my life and you know all the things that I went through from you know birth to adulthood, right? Nice. Um, you know, unresolved trauma, you know, urban community story, but also you know success at the same time. With Coffee and Chemtrails, I wanted to not so talk about myself, but to talk about my journey and my development as you know a fully fledged adult, mm-hmm. right? So earlier we talked about you know college and how you have this, you know, window that you should probably look at right after you finish high school to learn how to navigate independently, you know, in society. Mm-hmm. And what they what they're starting to, you know, speak about in some of the um, social communities is that there's this level of the emerging adult. Yeah. Right? So it's not just child to you eighteen and then, you know, you're an adult. It's something called an emerging adult to where you kinda have to figure out what you're doing with your life. Right. And then you start to go on and, you know, uh, get into your career and some of the things that you want to invest, you know, the rest of your life. in, Right. And that's just because, you know, our society has changed so much with um, the uh, the difference of the technology age Mm -hmm. opposed to the manufacturer age. Right. You can go outside and start working on cars. You're good. Now it's like you got to go learn a trade and then you got to learn how to make a transfer in, you know, technology. so with this album, it's like speaking about what that development piece looks like, right? Mm-hmm. You have people that are going to judge you, right? You're going to have people that are going to hear some of the ideas that you have, right? And they're going to shut it down. How do you continue to instill confidence in yourself, all right? So on my one track, Doing It For Others, I said, they said I'm too, they said I'm too young for being a doctor. And to be a rapper, they said I'm too old. Forget that. I'm going to do both of those and collect that revenue comfortable, mm-hmm. right? And that's just speaking about the confidence that I have in myself no matter what happens, right? right? I drink coffee at the beginning of the day because I have a lot of stuff to get done. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm tired, I need that extra kick, yeah. right? And I'm like socially aware. So like when it comes to speaking about things such as like chemtrails and it's like bring you down and secretly killing us, right? Sometimes we're secretly killing ourselves. We're secretly killing our own dreams because we can't have conversation or feel confident enough to have conversation about goals that we set out for ourselves and then going out and doing them. Right, right. Cause so if social media can't validate it, I don't want to do it. Right. No, that's that's a that's a great great point because you gotta, you know, you. I feel like that goes back to what we were saying. When you have a goal, you really have to model it down to like, all right, what am I gonna do on a day to day to weekly basis to get to it? Because then that makes that goal a reality. Mm-hmm. Once you have a big goal, it can be scary because you don't really know what the blueprint is to get there. Mm-hmm. But if you really just like figure out, all right, this is how I'm going to get there, and you're very practical and rational about it, mm-hmm. that's how you can really. That's when it becomes real, you mm-hmm. know. Because yeah. that's scary. Any, you know, they say, oh, you know, people. Uh, reason people don't succeed is fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's fear, but the fear is really due to a lack of. Um, it's really just due to a lack of preparation, I mm-hmm. feel, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's one big thing, like I think a motto that really I've seen throughout this interview is that there's a lack of preparation when coming out of jail, mm-hmm. when setting up your career, mm-hmm. music, whatever, yep. when going to college or mm-hmm. figuring out that you have all this autonomy but not setting up a mm-hmm. schedule and getting caught up in the sauce, you know? Mm-hmm. Most that, definitely. You know, it could be beer sauce in college, yeah. you know? So um, that that is a big thing I think the viewers should should get um, out of that. Is there another, like, thing, another motto that you would like to maybe talk about mm-hmm. before we kind of sum things up here about, you know, maybe that you kind of, that comes to mind that you think a lot of people should really take home after watching this interview today? Another model that I think about, you know, and it came right to me as you were talking, is no peripherals. Right. Right? That's something that I kind of talked to my cousin Pete out about when we're trying to get focused with the music. Is like, if you look straight forward to what your goals are and you're not worried about what's happening to the left and to the right of you, you won't be influenced to the fact that you start getting discouraged. Yeah. Right? So I sit here and I put this picture up and this picture on Instagram gets 50 likes. And I'm happy. I got 50 likes on Instagram, but then I scroll down and see the picture underneath me. 
and somebody that's on the same level with me, they got 150 likes. Yeah. So now the value of these 50 likes just went down only because I looked at his 150. Right. Right. But if I stay focused on the goals that I have for myself, right, and I keep pushing, I'm not even sitting there and being discouraged. I'm continuing to move forward. So I'm going to get 50 likes, another 50 likes, and another 50 likes. I got 150. Right, right. Right. Just keep moving forward and stay focused. Mm -hmm. That's it. Another track I got, and, and they, they polarize each other on, on coffee and chem shows. There's one called doing it for others. The other one's called doing it for me. Mm -hmm. And, then, you know, on, there, on the hook, I say people criticize me like, like they're getting paid. Right, social media is set up for us to be able to validate again, you know, with likes and comments. If I like and comment, I can tell you what I like about something that you showed me. Right. right? And if you don't if you tell me something that I don't like, <clears throat> I might believe that, you know, I shouldn't be going down this path. Yeah. You can speak you can look at all the different people who are like billionaires and millionaires, right? And people told them that they shouldn't do something. Oh, and they sure. decided to do it anyway yeah. because they were confident in themselves and continue to move forward. Yeah. Right? I think it was something that I saw the other day about the, uh, there was the person who was the fourth founding member of Apple or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. It might've just been like a clickbait, yeah. but apparently like he pulled his investment in Apple and if he'd have stayed in, it'd be worth like a hundred, five hundred million dollars or something today. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's like, you know, he was probably looking at that company and saying, you know, our company isn't moving as fast as Microsoft, so I'm just pulling my money from it. Then all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. Now you're missing out. No, for sure. Right? So if you stop looking at the things that are to the left and to the right of you and just stay focused on, you know, the things that you want to hit and do it successfully and to the best of your ability, you'll be fine. Just be consistent and constant with it. No, for sure. And I, I, I have that problem myself, you know, because it's, it's a lot easier said than done because mm -hmm. so, we're living in a social media age where mm -hmm. it's like, Yo, you, you feel super hyped, you just sold out a show, mm -hmm. and then you look up, like, you're just going, scrolling through Instagram, it's like, oh, shit, you know, my boy just made 30 under 30 and 4. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But you could use it as a good way, like, mm -hmm. word, like, let's not get stagnant, like, mm -hmm. let's keep pushing, you yeah. know? But you gotta know you. Right, right. Am I still putting my all in? All right, bet. But, like, there's still so much more work to be done. You still gotta have that tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. And you gotta know, like, yo, you, everyone had... Life is a marathon, not a sprint. Exactly. So if you're going with that mentality, mm -hmm. you're gonna be okay because you're not... All right, shit, I, my boy made 30 under 30, whatever. Like, you yeah. might be a little... Like, not... Not like a hater, but like, damn, like I got so much work to do, mm -hmm. but you'll be able to get over that quick and get back to what you got to do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You can't let that other outside noise discourage your journey, mm -hmm. you know? Like, And yeah, that that's very true. Like maybe when you're working or something like, yo, just, just you know, put some put some music on and don't put on the social media for a little mm -hmm. bit, you know what I mean? Like, I put that thing down, yeah, man, because it will mess up your whole day. Nah, straight up. Like, like even so, <laughs> and it's crazy how we look at it, like somebody's success has now made me not as confident in what I'm doing. Right, right. Like, how? Yeah, that, that's crazy. It shouldn't even work like that. Nah, for sure. But we now, like, they've re-engineered our minds to compete with each other on what we're doing, right? Yeah. So it's fine if things are like completely connected to where, you know, we're both sitting on the corner of Harlem. I got a lemon, lemonade stand. You got an apple juice stand. Right. And I'm over here looking at you like, damn, like he's selling out this apple juice. Like, what's, what's so bad about my lemonade? Because we're direct competitors. Right. But if you all the way, you know, across town and you got your stand and it's thriving. But look, I'm all the way across town. I have this market to tap into. Why am I worried about what he's doing all the way up there? Nah, for sure. You know, you should be worried about what I could be doing to get these sales up. You yeah. know, <laughs> nah, for sure. Um, where can the people find you on your social media? Speaking of that, <laughs> he's <laughs> channeling yeah, everything. Q U I S C H A N D L A. Um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Apple Music, Spotify, Ty anywhere that you get music, they can find me. YouTube. Okay. All that good stuff. No, so for sure. Also check out uh, trueandliving.com too to get like all the information you want to get about our site and True and Living L L C T R U E N L I V I N L L C on Instagram and all platforms. No, for sure. I, I really appreciate you sitting down with us. S super excited to check out your projects. I'm gonna definitely dive in now that I got the great narrative behind right. it, you know. So that's all I can ask, man. Listen, man, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure for me too. Appreciate it.